Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. This is Insights into Entertainment, Episode 1, Polynesian Paradise. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and I'm here with my co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hello, everyone. We are on location for this podcast at the Polynesian Hotel and Resort in Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Today, our topic is going to be all things Disney for our kickoff. Before we get into that, though, it would be worthwhile to establish Michelle's credentials, at least, as far as being a Disney authority. You are a member of D23, is that correct? That is correct. You are a DVC member. That is also correct. You are a annual pass holder. A few years off and on, yes. Uh, you are a Disney Visa card holder. I am. Um, you are also a multi-year applicant to the Disney Moms panel, are you not? Correct. Um, you are also a Disney stockholder. Correct. So you have a... And so, I was also a Disney cast member. And you were a Disney cast member. And you were, you've were you been to Disney how many times? A lot. Yeah. A <laughs> lot. I would say probably... Maybe we're up to 50 or 60 by and, now. And are they all Disney World? No. I have been to Disneyland a few times, but I have not done any of the uh overseas disney parks okay as of yet okay so i think i think that establishes your credentials as a disney authority or a really obsessive compulsive disney holic that too (laughs) so let's start off with the burning question in everyone's mind Is Disney World the happiest place on Earth? It depends. It can be. I think depending on how your experience goes, Disney does try to to make it the happiest place on Earth. But things just happen where it, it's not the happiest place, you know, on Earth. Um, I think we've seen it with a few of our trips that, that we've taken together. Um the one trip where you wrote a very, you know, nasty letter to to Disney after the experience because it just seemed like, for us, everything was going wrong with the trip. And one problem after another after another, and it wasn't that happiest trip. But yet there are people that I know that have had, you know, come down here and get an upgraded room or they get some sort of special treatment that they weren't expecting. Um, And then it turns out to be, you know, the best vacation that they've ever had. And we've also had experiences of our own where just a out of the blue thing has happened where if we were someplace else, would that have that same experience have, have happened to us if we were, you know, at great wolf lodge or, you know, a six flags, amusement park so just for the record you do acknowledge that it might not necessarily be the happiest place on earth is that correct i can neither confirm nor deny (laughs) (laughs) i know for me personally this is definitely my happy place and i think a lot of it also has to do with because i came here as a kid with my parents i was very fortunate to have had a few Disney vacations, you know, growing up. So it, it's kind of like, for me, passing the torch to, you know, to my family, to my daughter. You know, my mother first came to Disney World when she was pregnant with me. And it's kind of the joke that, you know, it was the DNA or whatever. And we came here while I was pregnant with our daughter. So it's, you know, there, there's, for me, it's, it's like a family tradition, you know, where some 
pair you know some families do ski trips that's their tradition or they do trips down to the shore or something disney for me happens to kind of be like a family tradition for me and it's a multi multi-generational absolutely experience as well Is Disney still relevant, Disney World will say, is Disney World still relevant today as it was in the 70s and 80s? You know, it's it's kind of hard because I think we were talking about this the other day that up until recently, in some cases, Disney didn't feel the need to change things up. You know, you had rides that had been stable since the park opened in 1971 and they didn't modify anything. Maybe they upgraded some of the technology, but for the most part, it was the same ride. If you had gone in 1971 as, as you went now, but I think with the other theme parks in the area, universal sea world, you know, maybe not so much, the competition came, especially with Harry Potter and that whole section, you know, of, of Universal just kind of blew up. And Disney realized, I think, that they needed to, you know, upgrade certain things and add new things. So now you can see all of these new things that they're putting in. You know, we, we saw it today. Tron is coming to the Magic Kingdom, and there's this whole area closed off, and you can see the construction, and then you have... Um, Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, a ride coming in there in Epcot. And then you have changes to Hollywood Studios where you have the whole Galaxy's Edge Star Wars land coming in. Plus even, you know, the great movie ride, which was a staple of Hollywood Studios that shut down last year. And now you have a Mickey and Minnie ride coming in so they realize you know what we can't leave things the same we need to be upgrading that's an interesting uh point you mentioned with the mickey mini ride is it true that that's the first mickey mouse ride to appear in any disney park yeah that's the first mickey you know exclusive ride back in the day they had america sings i want to say i'm sure we'll probably get people that are like no it was this ride um they had something mickey was Part of the ride. Um, well, it wasn't a ride, it was a show. You know, so he's been visual. You know, you've been able to see him just like Mickey. Sure, and he appears in Fantasmic, Mickey's right. Philharmonic, uh, Magic. Right. So he appears in, you know, certain things, but he's never been the focal point of just an actual ride. An actual ride. Yeah. Can Disney, a trip to Disney World, can that be considered or can it be managed as an affordable family vacation? I think if you do it right, you can. You can obviously go over the top. You know, I I think now, you know, you watch TV for, you know, an hour, you're going to see a Disney World commercial and, you know, they make it out to be, you know, this affordable trip, you know. They have multiple resorts of various dollar amounts. You know, you can stay at what they consider a value resort for a lower amount. Or if, you know, the sky's the limits, you stay at a deluxe resort. So, uh, you know, depending on what time of year you go, what kind of package you go, you know, I think there there is a Disney vacation within anybody's price range. Okay, fair enough. And we've stayed at z- several different levels. I mean, we're, we're obviously staying at a deluxe right. resort now. We've stayed at All Stars, and we've stayed at the Moderates. And mm-hmm. Yeah, we've stayed at, at all various levels, and there's been pros and cons of, of all of them. I think, you know, for us, when we stay at the value resorts, I think, you know, the, the one disadvantage that we tend to have is the transportation. It always seems to take a little bit longer to get any of the transportation to come or you're sharing the bus with, you know, multiple locations. But now that we've been driving down 
as often as as we have now transportation depending on where we're staying sometimes we just take our own car and then we don't have to worry about you know waiting for a bus or a boat or a monorail do you do you think disney is trying to keep vacations affordable for the average family you know it seems like they are but then every day you see oh look park ticket prices are going up again you know how many times within a year does the average ticket price go up how many times does the annual pass go up so it, it they're obviously trying to compensate for oh well we're making all these upgrades and we're doing all of this stuff so you know the money has to come from somewhere but i think a lot of you know you 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 don't see what you're getting for it and honestly you know we really don't do other types of theme parks so to say how much you know the difference is in price between staying you know at disney and staying at you know xyz to to compare and contrast you know we know quick serve food you know ever everybody always complains oh the food is so you know expensive but you go to great adventure and it's expensive you go to you know great wolf lodge great wolf lodge is really expensive (laughs) most people that go to great wolf lodge only stay one night because it's you know it's so expensive whereas most people that come to disney you know probably stay three to four days on average well disney definitely does do a lot of expansion these days they've been doing a lot of construction a lot of its infrastructure that they've been doing they, oh absolutely been doing some park expansions obviously with uh, the galaxy's edge and the toy story land Do you think it's fair that Disney is taking the money out of the the attendees rather than out of the other branches that it has, where it's bringing in you know billion dollar movies on a regular basis now, that where that's bringing revenue in? Do you think do you think Disney's digging that money from the right place? Um, I don't know because you know you would think as a company if one hand had a whole lot and the other didn't that they'd kind of like, okay, we'll give you a little bit from here. And and I don't know. I don't know their financials to say, oh, because of how much is coming in through the, the animation we can give to the theme park. I think That's a fair point. I think they might keep it all as their own, you know, different entities. I know the biggest joke or not joke, um, from cast members that I knew when Shanghai Disneyland opened. And, you know, they got Boku money to do all these great, fantastic rides. You know, if you if you go on YouTube and, and you search the various different rides, just the ride technology that they use is just fantastic. And everyone's like, well, why don't they have that here? Oh, well, because it went to Shanghai, you know. Oh, we, we can't get a, a new paint job because all the money went to Shanghai. So I think within all of the different theme parks, they all share their pot <laughs> of, of money. But I don't think they, you know, they go back and forth between the different uh, divisions. Makes sense. Is Disney World just a once in a lifetime opportunity? Or do you think it's realistic for people to come back on a regular basis like you have and we have? I don't know. I, I think there are people that, you know, it really depends on, on what you like to do as as a family or as an individual or, or what. I think there are people that treat Disney as it's we're doing it once, we're never going to do it again. So let's splurge on this. Let's do, you know, this dining plan or eat at this restaurant or whatever. Obviously, if it was a once in a lifetime thing, they wouldn't offer an annual pass. You know, so they they want people to come back and visit multiple times. You have, you know, people that are Florida residents that get special deals to be able, you know, to come in the park. Well, they they don't just offer an annual pass. They offer... Several flavors of annual passes. Right, exactly. And, and that's what I, I was 
um, about to say is that like for the Florida residents, they have certain annual passes that have blackout dates. So when it's the busiest time for the Disney parks, you can't as an annual pass holder get into the park those days. Um, so it's basically an off season pass. Um, I have a friend of mine who actually, she's a Florida resident and she has an Epcot only pass. And I didn't even realize that they did one park type passes. And again, that's something for Florida, you know, residents. I know that they have special tickets for after four o'clock for Florida residents to, to come. So in a way, yes. They cater to those once in a lifetime, like, oh, do, you know, the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique or, um, you know, go horseback riding or go on a boat or, or something, you know, those, those types of once in a lifetime things. But then again, you know, it's always welcome home when you check in now. Like, even if they don't know that you're a DVC, it's always welcome home because I guess they figure, you know, you've been back once or twice already. So of all the times that you've been here, and obviously we've established there's a lot, <laughs> what is it that keeps drawing you back? I don't know. I, I think a lot of it is just part of that family tradition. You know, I go on the Haunted Mansion and I think of my parents um, you know, and I go to the Country Bear Jamboree and as corny as it is and Big Al reminds me of my dad because I remember coming here and, and watching, you know, different shows and, and things like that, you know, with my parents and my parents are no longer here. So it's kind of a way to keep their memory alive. So, you know, and, and every Disney fanatic has their own, you know, reason. I have one friend who, um, whose son is autistic and Buzz Lightyear is his most favorite character ever. And he, um, you know, whenever she shares a story about, you know, coming to Disney with her son and as soon as he sees Buzz Lightyear, he becomes a completely different person. Um, you know, so it, so for them, it's it's that magical event. And sometimes, you know, it's, you know, if you're the fam type of family that maybe you don't really do things together on your vacations, it's kind of hard to come to Disney and not do something together, go on a ride together, or, and just have fun and, and be a kid. I think that's really the biggest thing is, you know, it, it keeps you young. There's a lot of things that that Disney does right. There's a lot of things I think that Disney probably does wrong. What are a couple of the things that you think they do right? And I'm not talking simple stuff. I'm I'm talking the above and beyond, the 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 magical moments if I can use a cliche. Okay. Well, I think one of the biggest things and fortunately we we don't have to take advantage of it. But I have lots of friends who them themselves have very specific food allergies or their children have specific food allergies above and beyond the peanut allergy and whatever. And Disney is one of the only places that I know of that will cater and bend over backwards to be able to feed, <laughs> feed whatever issues you might have you know you go to a restaurant and it could be a quick serve restaurant and the chef will come out and talk to you and ask you you know what can i make special for you or you go to you know a sit-down restaurant same thing you know they go above and beyond um you know and even you know kids and 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 adults with disabilities a lot of you know the rides have some sort of modification so that a wheelchair can get on the ride so that, you know, a child or an adult can actually go on said ride. Now, granted, you know, there are certain rides you have to be able to walk on to, you know, most of the roller coasters and things like that. But at least for a good portion of the rides, they make that accommodation so that, 
not just the person that broke their leg, you know, you know, any person with any kind of disability can still have that magical experience. So, so Disney really goes out of its way to be as all inclusive as reasonably possible. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that they, they came under some flack a couple of years ago because it was kind of easy to get a, a pass from guest relations where it allowed you basically to get on any ride right away. You basically showed the card, you got through the exit and you didn't have to wait. Well, what they found out was there was a travel agency in New York city, I believe. And they were basically, you know, you could hire them and they'd basically give you a note or they were like a tour guide for you and they'd get you a note. So for this extra $500 fee, Hey, we'll get you this disability card. So you won't have to wait online. So Disney changed their policy. And now in most cases, depending on what your disability is, what they ended up doing was changing a lot of the queue lines and making them wider so that if you were in a wheelchair, you could go through and wait online just like anybody else. But there are still those exceptions to the rules, you know, depending on what the issue is, where some people can still get the cards, but it's a, it's a lot fewer in, in, in between um, to, to get. But they do still do that if it's warranted. So I think your mention of queue lines at Disney is a great segue into my next question of <laughs> what does Disney do wrong? <sighs> The wait times. (laughs) I know we've had this discussion. We had this discussion today while we were waiting for our daughter to go on um, the Seven Dwarf Mine Train ride. We had a Fast Pass. And for those that don't know what a Fast Pass is, Disney has this sort of reservation system that you can make for certain rides. So the idea is that you can make up to three per day. And once they all have been used, then if there's more left for certain rides, you can continue to make them throughout the day. So basically what happens is when you reach a certain point in before your vacation, you can go online and you can kind of make these quote unquote reservations. And it's an hour time frame. Um, And depending on the park, sometimes they have a certain tier level. So um, as an example for Hollywood Studios, because they have the Toy Story rides, they have three Toy Story rides. You can't get all three on a fast pass for the same day. You could do one one day, one another day, one another day. Same thing with Animal Kingdom with the two rides that are in the Avatar Land. You can't get both in the same day. So depending on what park, and what rides, you, you have to kind of mix it up. So as an example, we had three fast passes. We had one for um, Peter Pan, which we usually, <laughs> that's the only way we go on Peter Pan because the wait time on Peter Pan is usually always an hour um, for a three minute ride. That's something that we've always said we would never wait over an hour for a three minute ride. It's just kind of ridiculous. So the only time, again, that we do Peter Pan is with a Fast Pass. So fortunately, we had that. So we made it, waited, what, maybe eight minutes total with a Fast Pass. But what they've started to do is for these rides that have these enormous wait times on average, they've now made a whole entertainment section of the queue line. So again, because I've never waited to go on Peter Pan, I don't know what the queue line looks like besides what I've seen in YouTube videos. So Disney has basically turned the experience of waiting for a ride into an attraction itself. Absolutely. And now they just released an app probably maybe six months ago, the Disney Play app, which is 
basically something for you to do while you're waiting um, waiting in, in line. They have different things for you to achievements to unlock while you're waiting in line or riding a certain ride. And then they even have certain games that you can play with other people while you're waiting in the queue line. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's something only Disney could get away with. Absolutely. Thinking strictly from a Disney World standpoint, do you think that Disney's moving in the right direction for its fans? Well, I, for one, I'm happy with with all of the changes. Mm. Um, I know for me, I am not a thrill ride person. That is why Disney has always been so special for me because it's a park that I can go to and go on the majority of the rides. There isn't, I don't have, you know, my short list is stuff that I don't go on versus growing up in, you know, New Jersey and, you know, working at Great Adventure and going to Great Adventure. There were, you know, my short list was the rides that I'd actually go on where I know that there are people that they're the thrill seekers. They like the roller coasters. They like the big rides. So like Guardians of the Galaxy, I'd love to go on it, but I'll never go <laughs> go on it. Um, you know, Tower of Terror, I would love to go on it, but it's just, I will never go on it. Um, Tron looks really cool from, you know, what I've seen. Not ever going to go on it. So for those, you know, the Mickey Mouse ride, though, totally there. Um, <laughs> but I think they're, they're adding things, you know, for, for all levels of, of guests, you know, out there now. As a stockholder yourself, do you think Disney's moving in the right direction for its stockholders? I'd have to probably say, yeah, because, you know, you, you see the attendance doesn't look like it's dropped off. It, it Obviously, there are days you can come to the park and you can walk on everything, but, you know, they're constantly, you know, making changes and improvements and people are still coming. So, obviously, they're doing something right. I think that's it for the podcast for this week. Thank you for your time, Michelle. Thank you, Joe. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.